Chapter 4 In a haze as of a dream, Darnell's thoughts seemed to move through the opening days of the next week. Perhaps nature had not intended that he should be practical or much given to that which is usually called sound common sense, but his training had made him desirous of good playing qualities of the mind, and he uneasily strove to account to himself for his strange mood of the Sunday night, as he had often endeavored to interpret the fancies of his boyhood and early manhood. At first he was annoyed by his want of success. The morning paper, which he always secured as the bus delayed at Uxbridge Road Station, fell from his hands unread, while he vainly reasoned, assuring himself that the threatened incursion of a whimsical old woman, though tiresome enough, was no rational excuse for those curious hours of meditation in which his thoughts seemed to have dressed themselves in unfamiliar fantastic habits, and to parley with him in a strange speech, and yet a speech that he understood. With such arguments, he perplexed his mind on the long, accustomed ride up the steep ascent of Holland Park, past the incongruous hustle of Notting Hill Gate, where, in one direction, a road shows the way to the snug, somewhat faded bowers and retreats of Bayswater, and in another, one sees the portal of the murky region of the slums. The customary companions of his morning's journey were in the seats about him. He heard the hum of their talk as they disputed concerning politics, and the man next to him, who came from Acton, asked him what he thought of the government now. There was a discussion, and a loud and excited one, just in front, as to whether rhubarb was a fruit or vegetable, and in his ear he heard Redman, who was a near neighbor, praising the economy of the wife. I don't know how she does it. Look here. What do you think we had yesterday? Breakfast. Fish cakes. Beautifully fried. Rich, you know. Lots of herbs. It's a receipt of her aunt's. You should just taste them. Coffee. Bread. Butter. Marmalade. And, of course, all the usual et ceteras. Dinner. Roast beef. Yorkshire. Potatoes. Greens. And horseradish sauce. Plum tart. Cheese. And where will you get a better dinner than that? Well, I call it wonderful. I really do. But in spite of these distractions, he fell into a dream as the bus rolled and tossed on its way citywards, and he strove to solve the enigma of his vigil of the night before, and as the shapes of trees and green lawns and houses passed before his eyes, and as he saw the procession moving on the pavement, and while the murmur of the streets sounded in his ears, all was to him strange and unaccustomed, as if he moved through the avenues of some city in a foreign land. It was, perhaps, on these mornings, as he rode to his mechanical work, that vague and floating fancies that must have long haunted his brain began to shape themselves, and to put on the form of definite conclusions, from which he could no longer escape, even if he had wished it. Darnell had received what is called a sound commercial education, and would, therefore, have found very great difficulty in putting into articulate speech any thought that was worth thinking. But he grew certain on these mornings that the common sense, which he had always heard exalted as man's supremest faculty, was, in all probability, the smallest and least considered item in the equipment of an ant of average intelligence. And with this, as an almost necessary corollary, came a firm belief that the whole fabric of life in which he moved was sunken past all thinking in the grossest absurdity, that he and all his friends and acquaintances and fellow workers were interested in matters in which men were never meant to be interested were pursuing aims which they were never meant to pursue, were, indeed, much like fair stones of an altar serving as a pigsty wall. Life, it seemed to him, was a great search for he knew not what. And in the process of the ages, one by one, the true marks upon the ways had been shattered or buried, or the meaning of the words had been slowly forgotten. 
One by one, the signs had been turned awry. The true entrances had been thickly overgrown. The very way itself had been diverted from the heights to the depths, till at last the race of pilgrims had become hereditary stonebreakers and ditch scourers on a track that led to destruction, if it led anywhere at all. Darnell's heart thrilled with a strange and trembling joy, with a sense that was all new, when it came to his mind that this great loss might not be a hopeless one, that perhaps the difficulties were by no means insuperable. It might be, he considered, that the stonebreaker had merely to throw down his hammer and set out, and the way would be plain before him, and a single step would free the delver in rubbish from the foul slime of the ditch. It was, of course, with difficulty and slowly that these things became clear to him. He was an English city clerk, flourishing towards the end of the nineteenth century, and the rubbish heap that had been accumulating for some centuries could not be cleared away in an instant. Again and again, the spirit of nonsense that had been implanted in him, as in his fellows, assured him that the true world was the visible and tangible one, the world in which good and faithful letter-copying was exchangeable for a certain quantum of bread, beef, and house-room, and that the man who copied letters well did not beat his wife, nor lose money foolishly, was a good man, fulfilling the end for which he had been made. But in spite of these arguments, in spite of their acceptance by all who were about him, he had the grace to perceive the utter falsity and absurdity of the whole position. He was fortunate in his entire ignorance of sixpenny science, but if the whole library had been projected into his brain, it would not have moved him to deny in the darkness that which he had known in the light. Darnell knew by experience that man is made a mystery for mysteries and visions, for the realization in his consciousness of ineffable bliss, for a great joy that transmutes the whole world, for a joy that surpasses all joys and overcomes all sorrows. He knew this certainly, though he knew it dimly, and he was apart from other men preparing himself for a great experiment. With such thoughts as these for his secret and concealed treasure, he was able to bear the threatened invasion of Mrs. Nixon with something approaching indifference. He knew, indeed, that her presence between his wife and himself would be unwelcome to him, and he was not without grave doubts as to the woman's sanity. But, after all, what did it matter? Besides, already a faint glimmering light had risen within him that showed the profit of self-negation, and in this matter he had preferred his wife's will to his own, et non sua poma. To his astonishment, he found a delight in denying himself his own wish, a process that he had always regarded as thoroughly detestable. This was a state of things which he could not in the least understand. But, again, though a member of a most hopeless class, living in the most hopeless surroundings that the world has ever seen, though he knew as much of the ascesis as of Chinese metaphysics, again he had the grace not to deny the light that had begun to glimmer in his soul. And he found a present reward in the eyes of Mary, when she welcomed him home after his foolish labors in the cool of the evening. They sat together, hand in hand, under the mulberry tree, at the coming of the dusk, and as the ugly walls about them became obscure and vanished into the formless world of shadows, they seemed to be freed from the bondage of shepherd's bush, freed to wander in that undisfigured, undefiled world that lies beyond the walls. Of this region, Mary knew little or nothing by experience, since her relations had always been of one mind with the modern world, which has for the true country an instinctive and most significant horror and dread. Mr. Reynolds had also shared in another odd superstition of these later days, 
that it is necessary to leave London at least once a year. Consequently, Mary had some knowledge of various seaside resorts on the south and east coasts, where Londoners gather in hordes, turn the sands into one vast bad music hall, and derive, as they say, enormous benefit from the change. But experiences such as these give but little knowledge of the country in its true and occult sense. And yet Mary, as she sat in the dusk beneath the whispering tree, knew something of the secret of the wood, of the valley shut in by high hills, where the sound of pouring water always echoes from the clear brook. And to Darnell these were nights of great dreams, for it was the hour of the work, the time of transmutation. And he who could not understand the miracle, who could scarcely believe in it, yet knew, secretly and half-consciously, that the water was being changed into the wine of a new life. This was ever the inner music of his dreams, and to it he added on these still and sacred nights the far-off memory of that time long ago when, a child, before the world had overwhelmed him, he journeyed down to the old grey house in the west, and for a whole month heard the murmur of the forest through his bedroom window, and when the wind was hushed, the washing of the tides about the reeds. And sometimes, awaking very early, he heard the strange cry of a bird as it rose from its nest among the reeds, and had looked out and had seen the valley whiten to the dawn, and the winding river whiten as it swam down to the sea. The memory of all this had faded and become shadowy as he grew older, and the chains of common life were riveted firmly about his soul. All the atmosphere by which he was surrounded was well-nigh fatal to such thoughts, and only now and again, in half-conscious moments or in sleep, he had revisited that valley in the far-off west, where the breath of the wind was an incantation, and every leaf and stream and hill spoke of great and ineffable mysteries. But now the broken vision was in great part restored to him, and looking with love in his wife's eyes, he saw the gleam of water pools in the still forest, saw the mists rising in the evening, and heard the music of the winding river. They were sitting thus together on the Friday evening of the week that had begun with that odd and half-forgotten visit of Mrs. Nixon, when, to Darnell's annoyance, the doorbell gave a discordant peal and Alice, with some disturbance of manner, came out and announced that a gentleman wished to see the master. Darnell went into the drawing-room, where Alice had lit one gas so that it flared and burnt with the rushing sound, and in this distorting light there waited a stout elderly gentleman, whose countenance was altogether unknown to him. He stared blankly and hesitated, about to speak, but the visitor began. You don't know who I am, but I expect you'll know my name. It's Nixon. He did not wait to be interrupted. He sat down and plunged into narrative, and after the first few words, Darnell, whose mind was not altogether unprepared, listened without much astonishment. And the long and the short of it is, Mr. Nixon said at last, she's gone stark staring mad. And we had to put her away today. Poor thing. His voice broke a little, and he wiped his eyes hastily, for though stout and successful, he was not unfeeling, and he was fond of his wife. He had spoken quickly, and had gone lightly over many details which might have interested specialists in certain kinds of mania, and Darnell was sorry for his evident distress. I came here... He went on after a brief pause, because I found out she had been to see you last Sunday, and I knew the sort of story she must have told. Darnell showed him the prophetic leaflet which Mrs. Nixon had dropped in the garden. Did you know about this? he said. Oh, him, said the old man, with some approach to cheerfulness. 
Oh, yes, I thrashed him, black and blue, the day before yesterday. Isn't he mad? Who is the man? He's not mad. He's bad. He's a little Welsh skunk named Richards. He's been running some sort of chapel over at New Barnet for the last few years. And my poor wife, she could never find the parish church good enough for her, had been going to his damned schism shop for the last twelve months. It was all that finished her off. Yes, I thrashed him the day before yesterday, and I'm not afraid of a summons either. I know him, and he knows I know him. Old Nixon whispered something in Darnell's ear and chuckled faintly as he repeated for the third time his formula. I thrashed him, black and blue, the day before yesterday. Darnell could only murmur his condolences and express his hope that Mrs. Nixon might recover. The old man shook his head. I'm afraid there is no hope of that, he said. I've had the best advice, but they couldn't do anything and told me so. Presently, he asked to see his niece, and Darnell went out and prepared Mary as well as he could. She could scarcely take in the news that her aunt was a hopeless maniac, for Mrs. Nixon, having been extremely stupid all her days, had naturally succeeded in passing with her relations as typically sensible. With the Reynolds family, as with the great majority of us, want of imagination is always equated with sanity, and though many of us have never heard of Lombroso, we are his ready-made converts." We have always believed that poets are mad, and if statistics unfortunately show that few poets have really been inhabitants of lunatic asylums, it is soothing to learn that nearly all poets have had whooping cough, which is, doubtless, like intoxication, a minor madness. But is it really true? she asked at length. Are you certain uncle is not deceiving you? Aunt seemed so sensible always. She was helped at last by recollecting that Aunt Marion used to get up very early in mornings, and then went into the drawing room and talked to the old man. His evident kindliness and honesty grew upon Mary, in spite of a lingering belief in her aunt's fables, and when he left, it was with a promise to come see them again. Mrs. Darnell said she felt tired and went to bed, and Darnell returned to the garden and began to pace to and fro, collecting his thoughts. His immeasurable relief at the intelligence that, after all, Mrs. Nixon was not coming to live with them taught him that, despite his submission, his dread of the event had been very great. The weight was removed, and now he was free to consider his life without reference to the grotesque intrusion that he had feared. He sighed for joy, and as he paced to and fro, he savored the scent of the night, which, though it came faintly to him in that brick-bound suburb, summoned to his mind across many years the odor of the world at night as he had known it in that short sojourn of his boyhood. The odor that rose from the earth when the flame of the sun had gone down beyond the mountain, and the afterglow had paled in the sky and on the fields. And as he recovered as best he could these lost dreams of an enchanted land, there came to him other images of his childhood, forgotten and yet not forgotten, dwelling unheeded in dark places of the memory, but ready to be summoned forth. He remembered one fantasy that had long haunted him, as he lay half asleep in the forest on one hot afternoon of that memorable visit to the country, he had made believe that a little companion had come to him out of the blue mists and the green light beneath the leaves, a white girl with long black hair who had played with him and whispered her secrets in his ear as his father lay sleeping under a tree. And from that summer afternoon, day by day, she had been beside him. She had visited him in the wilderness of London, and even in recent years there had come to him now and again the sense of her presence, in the midst of the heat and turmoil of the city. The last visit he remembered well, 
It was a few weeks before he married, and from the depths of some futile task he had looked up with puzzled eyes, wondering why the close air suddenly grew scented with green leaves, why the murmur of the trees and the wash of the river on the reeds came to his ears. And then that sudden rapture, to which he had given a name and an individuality, possessed him utterly. He knew then how the dull flesh of man can be like fire. And now, looking back from a new standpoint on this and other experiences, he realized how all that was real in his life had been unwelcomed, uncherished by him, had come to him, perhaps, in virtue of merely negative qualities on his part. And yet, as he reflected, he saw that there had been a chain of witnesses all through his life. Again and again, Voices had whispered in his ear words in a strange language that he now recognized as his native tongue. The common street had not been lacking in visions of the true land of his birth, and in all the passing and repassing of the world he saw that there had been emissaries ready to guide his feet on the way of the great journey. A week or two after the visit of Mr. Nixon, Darnell took his annual holiday. There was no question of Walton on the Nays, or of anything of the kind, as he quite agreed with his wife's longing for some substantial sum put by against the evil day. But the weather was still fine, and he lounged away the time in his garden beneath the tree, or he sauntered out on long aimless walks in the western purlieus of London, not unvisited by that old sense of some great ineffable beauty concealed by the dim and dingy veils of grey interminable streets. Once, on a day of heavy rain, he went to the box room and began to turn over the papers in the old hair trunk, scraps and odds and ends of family history, some of them in his father's handwriting, others in faded ink, and there were a few ancient pocket books filled with manuscript of a still earlier time, and in these the ink was glossier and blacker than any writing fluids supplied by stationers of later days. Darnell had hung up the portrait of the ancestor in this room, and had bought a solid kitchen table and a chair, so that Mrs. Darnell, seeing him looking over his old documents, half thought naming the room Mr. Darnell's Study. He had not glanced at these relics of his family for many years, but from the hour when the rainy morning sent him to them, he remained constant to research till the end of the holidays. It was a new interest, and he began to fashion in his mind a faint picture of his forefathers, and of their life in that grey old house in the river valley, in the western land of wells and streams and dark and ancient woods. And there were stranger things than mere notes on family history amongst that odd litter of old, disregarded papers. And when he went back to his work in the city, some of the men fancied that he was in some vague manner changed in appearance. But he only laughed when they asked him where he had been, and what he had been doing with himself. But Mary noticed that every evening he spent at least an hour in the box-room, she was rather sorry at the waste of time involved in reading old papers about dead people. And one afternoon, as they were out together on a somewhat dreary walk towards Acton, Darnell stopped at a hopeless second-hand bookshop, and after scanning the rows of shabby books in the window, went in and purchased two volumes. They proved to be a Latin dictionary and grammar, and she was surprised to hear her husband declare his intention of acquiring the Latin language. But, indeed, all his conduct impressed her as indefinably altered, and she began to be a little alarmed, though she could scarcely have formed her fears in words. But she knew that in some way that was all indefined and beyond the grasp of her thought, their lives had altered since the summer, and no single thing wore quite the same aspect as before. If she looked out into the dull street with its rare loiterers, it was the same, and yet it had altered. And if she opened the window in the early morning, the wind that entered came with a changed breath that spoke the same message that she could not understand. 
and day by day passed by in the old course, and not even the four walls were altogether familiar, and the voices of men and women sounded with strange notes, with the echo rather of a music that came over unknown hills. And day by day, as she went about her household work, passing from shop to shop in those dull streets that were a network, a fatal labyrinth of grey desolation on every side, there came to her sense half-seen images of some other world, as if she walked in a dream, and every moment must bring her to light and to awakening, when the grey should fade, and regions long desired should appear in glory. Again and again it seemed as if that which was hidden would be shown even to the sluggish testimony of sense. And as she went to and fro from street to street of that dim and weary suburb, and looked on those grey material walls, they seemed as if a light glowed behind them, and again and again the mystic fragrance of incense was blown to her nostrils from across the verge of that world which is not so much the impenetrable as ineffable, and to her ears came the dream of a chant that spoke of hidden choirs about all her ways. She struggled against these impressions, refusing her assent to the testimony of them, since all the pressure of credited opinion for three hundred years had been directed towards stamping out real knowledge, and so effectually has this been accomplished that we can only recover the truth through much anguish. And so Mary passed the days in a strange perturbation, clinging to common things and common thoughts as if she feared that one morning she would wake up in an unknown world to a changed life. And Edward Darnell went day by day to his labor and returned, in the evening, always with that shining of light within his eyes and upon his face, with a gaze of wonder that was greater day by day, as if for him the veil grew thin and soon would disappear. From these great matters, both in herself and in her husband, Mary shrank back, afraid, perhaps, that if she began the question, the answer might be too wonderful. She rather taught herself to be troubled over little things. She asked herself what attraction there could be in the old records over which she supposed Edward to be poring night after night in the cold room upstairs. She had glanced over the papers at Darnell's invitation, but could see little interest in them. There were one or two sketches, roughly done in pen and ink, of the old house in the west. It looked a shapeless and fantastic place, furnished with strange pillars and stranger ornaments on the projecting porch, and on one side a roof dipped down almost to the earth, and in the center there was something that might almost be a tower rising above the rest of the building. Then there were documents that seemed all names and dates, with here and there a coat of arms done in the margin, and she came upon a string of uncouth Welsh names linked together by the word op in a chain that looked endless. There was a paper covered with signs and figures that meant nothing to her, and then there were the pocket books full of old-fashioned writing, and much of it in Latin, as her husband told her. It was a collection as void of significance as a treatise on conic sections, so far as Mary was concerned. But night after night, Darnell shut himself up with the musty rolls, and more than ever, when he rejoined her, he bore upon his face the blazonry of some great adventure. And one night she asked him what interested him so much in the papers he had shown her. He was delighted with the question. Somehow they had not talked much together for the last few weeks, and he began to tell her of the records of the old race from which he came, of the old strange house of grey stone between the forest and the river. The family went back and back, he said, far into the dim past, beyond the Normans, beyond the Saxons, far into the Roman days, and for many hundred years they had been petty kings, with a strong fortress high up on the hill in the heart of the forest, and even now the great mounds remained, 
whence one could look through the trees towards the mountain on one side and across the yellow sea on the other. The real name of the family was not Darnell. That was assumed by one Violo Aptalisen ap Eorweth in the 16th century. Why, Darnell did not seem to understand. And then he told her how the race had dwindled in prosperity, century by century, till at last there was nothing left but the grey house and a few acres of land bordering the river. And do you know, Mary, he said, I suppose we shall go and live there some day or other. My great uncle, who has the place now, made money in business when he was a young man, and I believe he will leave it all to me. I know I am the only relation he has. How strange it would be! What a change from the life here! You never told me that. Don't you think your great uncle might leave his house and his money to somebody he knows really well? You haven't seen him since you were a little boy, have you? No, but we write once a year, and from what I have heard my father say, I am sure the old man would never leave the house out of the family. Do you think you would like it? I don't know. Isn't it very lonely? I suppose it is. I forget whether there are any other houses in sight, but I don't think there are any at all near. But what a change! No city, no streets, no people passing to and fro, only the sound of the wind and the sight of the green leaves and the green hills and the song of the voices of the earth. He checked himself suddenly, as if he feared that he was about to tell some secret that must not yet be uttered. And indeed, as he spoke of the change from the little street in Shepherd's Bush to that ancient house in the woods of the far west, a change seemed already to possess him, and his voice put on the modulation of an antique chant. Mary looked at him steadily and touched his arm, and he drew a long breath, before he spoke again. It is the old blood calling to the old land, he said. I was forgetting that I am a clerk in the city. It was, doubtless, the old blood that suddenly stirred in him, the resurrection of the old spirit that for many centuries had been faithful to secrets that are now disregarded by most of us, that now, day by day, was quickened more and more in his heart and grew so strong that it was hard to conceal. He was, indeed, almost in the position of the man in the tale, who, by a sudden electric shock, lost the vision of the things about him in the London streets, and gazed instead upon the sea and shore of an island in the Antipodes. For Darnell only clung with an effort to the interests and the atmosphere which, till lately, had seemed all the world to him and the grey house and the wood and the river, symbols of the other sphere, intruded, as it were, into the landscape of the London suburb. But he went on, with more restraint, telling his stories of far-off ancestors, how one of them, the most remote of all, was called a saint, and was supposed to possess certain mysterious secrets, often alluded to in the papers as the hidden songs of Iolo Sant, and then, with an abrupt transition, he recalled memories of his father, and of the strange, shiftless life in dingy lodgings in the backwaters of London, of the dim stucco streets that were his first recollections, of forgotten squares in North London, and of the figure of his father, a grave, bearded man, who seemed always in a dream, as if he too sought for the vision of a land beyond the strong walls, a land where there were deep orchards and many shining hills, and fountains and water pools gleaming under the leaves of the wood. I believe my father earned his living, he went on, such a living as he did earn, at the record office and the British Museum. He used to hunt up things for lawyers and country parsons who wanted old deeds inspected. He never made much, and we were always moving from one lodging to another, always to out-of-the-way places where everything seemed to have run to seed. We never knew our neighbors. We moved too often for that. 
but my father had about a half dozen friends, elderly men like himself, who used to come to see us pretty often. And then, if there was any money, the lodging house servant would go out for beer, and they would sit and smoke far into the night. I never knew much about these friends of his, but they all had the same look, the look of longing for something hidden. They talked of mysteries that I never understood, very little of their own lives, and when they did speak of ordinary affairs, one could tell that they thought such matters as money and the wants of it were unimportant trifles. When I grew up and went into the city and met other young fellows and heard their way of talking, I wondered whether my father and his friends were not a little queer in their heads, but I know better now. So, night after night, Darnell talked to his wife, seeming to wander aimlessly from the dingy lodging houses, where he had spent his boyhood in the company of his father and the other seekers, to the old house hidden in that far western valley, and the old race that had so long looked at the setting of the sun over the mountain. But, in truth, there was one end in all that he spoke, and Mary felt that beneath his words, however indifferent they might seem, there was hidden a purpose, that they were to embark on a great and marvelous adventure. So, day by day, the world became more magical. Day by day, the work of separation was being performed. The gross accidents were being refined away. Darnell neglected no instruments that might be useful in the work and now he neither lounged at home on Sunday mornings, nor did he accompany his wife to the Gothic blasphemy which pretended to be a church. They had discovered a little church of another fashion in a back street, and Darnell, who had found in one of the old notebooks the maxim Incredibilia Sola Credenda, soon perceived how high and glorious a thing was that service at which he assisted. Our stupid ancestors taught us that we could become wise by studying books on science, by meddling with test tubes, geological specimens, microscopic preparations, and the like. But they who have cast off these follies know that they must read not science books, but mass books, and that the soul is made wise by the contemplation of mystic ceremonies and elaborate and curious rites. In such things, Darnell found a wonderful mystery language, which spoke at once more secretly and more directly than the formal creeds. And he saw that, in a sense, the whole world is but a great ceremony or sacrament, which teaches, under visible forms, a hidden and transcendent doctrine. It was thus that he found in the ritual of the church a perfect image of the world, an image purged, exalted, and illuminate, a holy house built up of shining and translucent stones, in which the burning torches were more significant than the wheeling stars, and the fuming incense was a more certain token than the rising of the mist. His soul went forth with the albid procession in its white and solemn order, the mystic dance that signifies rapture and a joy above all joys, and when he beheld love slain and rise again victorious, he knew that he witnessed, in a figure, the consummation of all things, the bridal of all bridles, the mystery that is beyond all mysteries, accomplished from the foundation of the world. So, day by day, the house of his life became more magical. And at the same time, he began to guess that if, in the new life, there are new and unheard of joys, there are also new and unheard of dangers. In his hidden manuscript books, which professed to deliver the outer sense of those mysterious hidden songs of Yolo Sant, there was a little chapter that bore the heading Von Sacher non in communum usum convertendus est and by diligence, with much use of the grammar and dictionary, Darnell was able to construe the by no means complex Latin of his ancestor. The special book which contained the chapter in question was one of the most singular in the collection, since it bore the title Terra de Yolo, 
and on the surface, with an ingenious concealment of its real symbolism, it affected to give an account of the orchards, fields, woods, roads, tenements, and waterways in the possession of Darnell's ancestors. Here, then, he read of the holy well, hidden in the Wistman's woods, Silva Sapientum, a fountain of abundant water, which no heats of summer can ever dry, which no flood can ever defile, which is as a water of life to them that thirst for life, a stream of cleansing to them that would be pure, and a medicine of such healing virtue that by it, through the might of God and the intercession of his saints, the most grievous wounds are made whole. But the water of this well was to be kept sacred perpetually. It was not to be used for any common purpose, nor to satisfy any bodily thirst but ever to be esteemed as holy, even as the water which the priest hath hallowed. And in the margin, a comment in a later hand taught Darnell something of the meaning of these prohibitions. He was warned not to use the well of life as a mere luxury of mortal life, as a new sensation, as a means of making the insipid cup of everyday existence more palatable. For, said the commenter, we are not called to sit as the spectators in a theatre, there to watch the play performed before us. But we are rather summoned to stand in the very scene itself, and there fervently to enact our parts in a great and wonderful mystery. Darnell could quite understand the temptation that was thus indicated. Though he had gone but a little way on the path, and had barely tested the overrunnings of that mystic well, he was already aware of the enchantment that was transmuting all the world about him informing his life with a strange significance and romance. London seemed a city of the Arabian Nights, and its labyrinths of streets and enchanted maze, its long avenues of lighted lamps were as starry systems, and its immensity became for him an image of the endless universe. He could well imagine how pleasant it might be to linger in such a world as this, to sit apart and dream, beholding the strange pageant played before him. But the sacred well was not for common use. It was for the cleansing of the soul and the healing of the grievous wounds of the spirit. There must be yet another transformation. London had become Baghdad. It must at last be transmuted to Sion, or in the phrase of one of his old documents, the city of the cup. And there were yet darker perils, which the Yolo manuscripts, as his father had named the collection, hinted at, more or less obscurely. There were suggestions of an awful region which the soul might enter, of a transmutation that was unto death, of evocations which could summon the utmost forces of evil from their dark places. In a word, of that sphere which is represented to most of us under the crude and somewhat childish symbolism of black magic. And here again he was not altogether without a dim comprehension of what was meant. He found himself recalling an odd incident that had happened long ago, which had remained all the years in his mind unheeded, amongst the many insignificant recollections of his childhood, and now rose before him, clear and distinct, and full of meaning. It was on that memorable visit to the old house in the west, and the whole scene returned, with its smallest events, and the voices seemed to sound in his ears. It was a grey, still day of heavy heat that he remembered. He had stood on the lawn after breakfast, and wondered at the great peace and silence of the world. Not a leaf stirred in the trees on the lawn, not a whisper came from the myriad leaves of the wood. The flowers gave out sweet and heavy odors, as if they breathed the dreams of the summer night. And far down the valley, the winding river was like dim silver under that dim and silvery sky, and the far hills and woods and fields vanished in the mist. The stillness of the air held him as with a charm. He leant all the morning against the rails that parted the lawn from the meadow, breathing the mystic breath of summer, 
and watching the fields brighten, as with the sudden blossoming of shining flowers, as the high mist grew thin for a moment before the hidden sun. As he watched thus, a man, weary with heat, with some glance of horror in his eyes, passed him on his way to the house. But he stayed at his post till the old bell in the turret rang, and they dined all together, masters and servants, in the dark, cool room that looked toward the still leaves of the wood. He could see that his uncle was upset about something, and when they finished dinner, he heard him tell his father that there was trouble at a farm, and it was settled that they should all drive over in the afternoon to some place with a strange name. But when the time came, Mr. Darnell was too deep in old books and tobacco smoke to be stirred from his corner, and Edward and his uncle went alone in the dog-cart. They drove swiftly down the narrow lane into the road that followed the winding river, and crossed the bridge at Caramain, by the mouldering Roman walls, and then, skirting the deserted, echoing village, they came out on a broad white turnpike road, and the limestone dust followed them like a cloud. Then, suddenly, they turned to the north, by such a road as Edward had never seen before. It was so narrow that there was barely room for a cart to pass, and the footway was of rock, and the banks rose high above them as they slowly climbed the long steep way, and the untrimmed hedges on either side shut out the light. And the ferns grew thick and green upon the banks, and hidden wells dripped down upon them. And the old man told him how the lane in winter was a torrent of swirling water, so that no one could pass by it. On they went, ascending and then again descending, always in that deep hollow under the wild woven boughs, and the boy wondered vainly what the country was like on either side. And now the air grew darker, and the hedge on one bank was but the verge of a dark and rustling wood and the grey limestone rocks had changed to dark red earth, flecked with green patches and veins of marl, and suddenly, in the stillness from the depth of the wood, a bird began to sing a melody that charmed the heart into another world, that sang to the child's soul of the blessed fairy realm beyond the woods of the earth, where the wounds of man are healed. And so, at last, after many turnings and windings, they came to a high bare land, where the lane broadened out into a kind of common, and along the edge of this place there were scattered three or four old cottages, and one of them was a little tavern. Here they stopped, and a man came out and tethered the tired horse to a post and gave him water. And old Mr. Darnell took the child's hand and led him by a path across the fields. The boy could see the country now, but it was all a strange, undiscovered land. They were in the heart of a wilderness of hills and valleys that he had never looked upon, and they were going down a wild, steep hillside, where the narrow path wound in and out amidst gorse and towering bracken, and the sun gleaming out for a moment. There was a gleam of white water far below in the narrow valley, where a little brook poured and rippled from stone to stone. They went down the hill and through a break, and then, hidden in dark green orchards, they came upon a long, low, whitewashed house, with a stone roof strangely colored by the growth of moss and lichens. Mr. Darnell knocked at a heavy oaken door, and they came into a dim room, where but a little light entered through the thick glass in the deep-set window. There were heavy beams in the ceiling, and a great fireplace sent out an odor of burning wood that Darnell never forgot, and the room seemed to him full of women who talked all together in frightened tones. Mr. Darnell beckoned to a tall, gray old man who wore corduroy knee breeches, and the boy, sitting on a high straight-backed chair, could see the old man and his uncle passing to and fro across the window panes as they walked together on the garden path. The women stopped their talk for a moment, and one of them brought him a glass of milk and an apple from some cold inner chamber. And then, suddenly, from a room above, there rang out a shrill and terrible shriek. And then, in a young girl's voice, a more terrible song. It was not like anything the child had ever heard, but as the man recalled it to his memory, he knew to what song it might be compared. 
to a certain chant, indeed, that summons the angels and archangels to assist in the great sacrifice. But as this song chants of the heavenly army, so did that seem to summon all the hierarchy of evil, the hosts of Lilith and Samael, in the words that rang out with such awful modulations, Numata inferorum, or in some unknown tongue that few men have ever heard on earth. The women glared at one another with horror in their eyes, and he saw one or two of the oldest of them clumsily make an old sign upon their breasts. Then they began to speak again, and he remembered fragments of their talk. She has been up there, said one, pointing vaguely over her shoulder. She'd never know the way, answered another. They be all gone that went there. There be not there in these days. How can you tell that, Quentian? Tis not for us to say that. My great-grandmother did know some that had been there, said a very old woman. She told me how they was taken afterwards. And then his uncle appeared at the door, and they went their way as they had come. Edward Darnell never heard any more of it nor whether the girl died or recovered from a strange attack. But the scene had haunted his mind in boyhood, and now the recollection of it came to him with a certain note of warning, as a symbol of dangers that might be in the way. It would be impossible to carry on the history of Edward Darnell and of Mary, his wife, to a greater length, since from this point their legend is full of impossible events, and seems to put on the semblance of the stories of the Grail. It is certain, indeed, that in this world they changed their lives, like King Arthur, but this is a work in which no chronicler has cared to describe with any amplitude of detail. Darnell, it is true, made a little book, partly consisting of queer verse which might have been written by an inspired infant, and partly made up of notes and exclamations in an odd dog Latin which he had picked up from the Yolo manuscripts. But it is to be feared that this work, even if published in its entirety, would cast but little light on a perplexing story. He called this piece of literature in Exitu Israel, and wrote on the title page the motto, doubtless of his own composition, Nunc certe scio cod omnia legenda, Omnis historiae, omnis fabulae, omnis scriptore, sint de memoria narrata. It is only too evident that his Latin was not learnt at the feet of Cicero, but in this dialect he relates the great history of the new life, as it was manifested to him. The poems are even stranger, one headed with an odd reminiscence of old-fashioned books, Lines written on looking down from a height in London, on a board school, suddenly lit up by the sun, begins thus. One day, when I was all alone, I found a wondrous little stone. It lay forgotten on the road, far from the ways of man's abode. When on this stone mine eyes I cast, I saw my treasure found at last. I pressed it hard against my face, I covered it with my embrace. I hid it in a secret place, and every day I went to see the stone that was my ecstasy, and worshipped it with flowers rare, and secret words, and sayings fair. O stone so rare, and red, and wise, O fragment of far paradise, O star whose light is life, O sea, whose ocean is infinity, thou art a fire that ever burns, and all the world to wonder turns, and all the dust of the dull day by thee is changed and purged away, so that wherever I look I see a world of a great majesty. The sullen river rolls all gold, the desert parks a fairy wold. When on the trees the wind is borne, I hear the sound of Arthur's horn. I see no town of grim gray ways, but a great city all ablaze, with burning torches to light up the pinnacles that shrine the cup. Ever the magic wine is poured, ever the feast shines on the board, ever the song is borne on high, 
that chants the holy magistri, etc., etc., etc. From such documents as these, it is clearly impossible to gather any very definite information. But on the last page, Darnell has written, So I awoke from a dream of a London suburb, of daily labor, of weary, useless little things. And as my eyes were opened, I saw that I was in an ancient wood, where a clear well rose into a gray film, and vapor beneath a misty, glimmering heat. And a form came towards me from the hidden places of the wood, and my love and I were united by the well.